Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Van Horn. I'm a partner in Dorsey's Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group. On behalf of Dorsey U and the M&A Practice Group, I'd like to welcome you to today's session on the basics of representations and warranties insurance. In addition to those of you with us here in Minneapolis, we have several people that are participating today by the internet, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I have a couple notes on logistics before we get started. First of all, if you're in the room with us here in Minneapolis, please be sure to fill out the green sheets uh, that are on your table. That's how we prepare the certificate so you can get CLE credit for this. And second, I know there are a few of you that are um, out there in the ether that will be reporting this in New York for CLE credit. And sometime during our hour today, I'll give you the secret code that you'll need to um, submit in order to get your New York CLE credit. For the session today, I'm joined by my partner, Dan Brown. Dan is a partner in Dorsey's trial group, and among Dan's areas of expertise are the insurance industry and insurance law issues. Dan and I are very pleased today to be joined by two seasoned deal professionals with real in-depth knowledge on representation and warranty insurance. To my left is Josh Halpern. Josh, I'll confess, I wrote that line about everyone being a seasoned deal professional <laughs> in my notes before. You and I have worked together a lot, but we've never met each other. And uh, I, I'll be forced to admit, um, before one of my partners beats me to it, that you've, you've um, more gracefully seasoned than some, <laughs> some of the rest of us on, on the Thank panel. You. So congratulations. Josh is a managing director with Aon Transaction Solutions based in New York City. And Matt Snevavice is managing director uh, in the Industrial Investment Banking Group at Piper Jaffray. And Matt's based here in Minneapolis, although more frequently found on a plane somewhere, I think. <laughs> so thanks, guys. We really appreciate uh, your participation today and appreciate you taking a little time to share with us. Um, in today's session, we'd like to focus on four principal topics. First is the state of the market for representations and warranties insurance generally. Second, we'd like to just cover some basics, nuts and bolts of a, of a representation and warranty insurance policy. Third, we'd like to talk a little bit about the, policy, uh, the process and timing for binding a policy, and finally, uh, share with you some ideas about how buyers and sellers have used um, buyers and sellers in an M&A transaction have used this product to strategic advantage. And if we have any time left after all of that, um, we'd like to say we may take a quick glance at some other um, transaction liability solutions products that Josh deals with that are used to mitigate common transactional risks. Uh, we also hope to have a few minutes at the end for your questions for the panel, but if you have questions as we go through the agenda, I'd encourage you to throw those out as, the, as they come up. Uh, before we get too far into our agenda, we should quickly address probably the most basic question here, what is representation and warranty insurance? So rep and, rep and warranty insurance is an insurance policy that covers post-closing losses that are sustained as a result of breaches of representations and warranties that are made by a seller in an M&A purchase agreement. The increased use of rep and warranty insurance has been widely discussed in trade papers uh, directed to M&A professionals, and it's even attracted the attention of the mainstream financial press for instance, in a column that ran last week in the New York Times deal book, rep and warranty insurance was called one of the hottest financial products of the year. So a little bit about the history of the product. I mean, this is not, and Josh, you can speak more to this, but this is not a new, a new product or a new offering. But um, from my perspective as a deal lawyer, I think it's really at some point in, in this current bull market uh, for M&A that we're in right now, it's, that's really been where the use of rep and warranty insurance has been transformed from a bit of a niche product that was you know, sometimes discussed but rarely used into truly a mainstream 
a mainstream deal tool that has gained wide acceptance among deal professionals. So, you know, that's the perspective I bring into it. Matt, I'd, I'd be interested in your perspective from the banking side. Do you, do you see it kind of the same way? Or are you seeing something different? Yeah, John, absolutely. Uh, I think this really was a niche product until probably two or three years ago where it was occasionally discussed but not really used. And, Josh, you may be able to elaborate on why it wasn't used. Maybe that was premiums. Maybe it was the insurers weren't committed to that. And there was a – maybe if you go back five or seven years ago, there was another brief wave when it got some excitement but never really took hold until this most recent uh, period. And so over the past two or three years, I would say it's really become the mainstream, particularly we work a lot with private equity firms. It's become very much uh, normal for private equity firms, either as a buyer or a seller, to use this. And, and even with some of our corporate clients that are on the buy side uh, will use this. And so the market's become really efficient, and I would say – in the past couple of years, the terms have become much more standardized, which goes to how common this is put in place. Yeah, I think that's right. It, it, it's been an interesting confluence of events that really, I think, is attributable to the growth. And so the product's actually been around since the very late 90s, um, but really wasn't used in earnest until about, just as Matt was saying, two to three years ago. And really what happened was carriers realized that this was a, a very legitimate opportunity that they weren't capitalizing on. And so over the past four or five years, pricing has gone down about, you know, 40 percent uh, since the high mark in 2008. Um, and in addition to that, they realized that part of the reason why people weren't buying this is because there was a big disconnect between what an indemnity was offering and what the policy coverage actually was. You know, th this predates my tenure at Aon. It really was while I was practicing. But, you know, seasoned practitioners' experience with this was it wasn't worth the paper it was written on because it was riddled with holes. And I think as the carriers started to get an additional level of comfort with it, they were a little bit more flexible and really covering the, the full spectrum of reps and warranties in a purchase agreement. You know, initially they were very skittish about the financial statements rep or the IP rep. And, you know, for a tech company, obviously that's the crux of the value of the deal and one of the most important clauses in the purchase agreement. So with that market shift of improved coverage that was matching up more closely with the indemnity, also I think the, the lights went off with a lot of financial buyers. And private equity buyers were realizing that this potentially would give them a competitive advantage. If they were able to bid on the same company as five other buyers and everybody was offering $100 million but requiring a, a $10 million holdback, if they were to use reps and warranties insurance and require less of an indemnity, their $100 million offer, but 98 up front, is far more attractive than the 100, but 90 up front. Uh, and so it really started to take traction. And I think as those financial buyers started to get more comfortable with it, it really caused there to be a market shift in the usage of the product. So, Josh, I mean, the pricing, I think, kind of speaks for itself. But on the sort of the conformance of the policies to the actual underlying uh, purchase agreements. We'll talk a little bit about this later in the program. It, is that now you know, the idea that these the, the policies are really kind of customized uh, indemnity agreements that match up f tightly with the underlying purchase agreement? It, are all I mean, is that all the carriers kind of on board with that program now, or is there still some discrepancy about um, you know uh, some carriers? writing to a more standard policy document, some more customization, or is that pretty much all standard? Is that all coalesced around kind of the custom model? It's a good question, and uh, I think there's, there's two things that are worthy of mention. The first is that for a reps and warranties insurance policy, it's, it's really it's, it's built on what we call excess and surplus lines. So it's not an approved form that each you know, state insurance department is going to be requiring. It is, it is a bespoke policy that's negotiated for every single transaction and is going to be tailored directly to the purchase agreement and the underlying acquisition. Um, I do think, though, and this is me you know, uh, discouraging people potentially from buying the policy, but you know, a lot of people that market the product say that, it, that it's a perfect replacement for an indemnity, and I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. Coverage today is very good, and it is very, very close to replacing an indemnity, but it doesn't quite do that. And so I think that is something that people should be cognizant of when, when you're entering into the transaction, that it's a little bit of a trade-off. It's giving you a competitive advantage by using the, the policy. It's smoothing the negotiation process 
and it's potentially a bargaining chip that you would have with the seller since you're going to be requiring less of a post-closing exposure or tail liability from them, but it's not going to be a total word-for-word -word replacement for the indemnity. So a few examples of that would be, you know, and the most obvious is, you know, you might have a, a no anti-sandbagging provision in the purchase agreement. But that same concept is not permitted in an insurance policy because an insurer is not going to allow you to take out this policy solely for the purpose of gaming them. So you can't go into the policy, bind coverage, with knowledge at the outset of the inception of that policy that you're already aware of a breach and that, you know, on day one, you're going to be lobbying in a claim. So you might have that benefit under the purchase agreement, depending on how you negotiate it. You're not going to have that benefit under the policy itself. And I don't mean to ramble, but one thing that's worthy of mention with that is how broad is that knowledge exclusion, because that really could limit coverage as well. So one, one other question before we kind of move on to the next section. Ed. Sure. So, Matt, you alluded to this. I'd be interested, Matt, your views and yours as well, Josh. I mean, I think pretty clearly private equity has been on the leading edge of this, and they were, they were the early adopters and have really driven – the, the acceptance of it in the marketplace. How, where are we with strategics? Uh, what's the market penetration? Is it just kind of the curves behind, but gaining acceptance kind of on the same curve as with private equity before them? Or is it still, um, you know, mostly a financial buyer's product? Where, where are we with that? I'd say from what we see, uh, it's Private equity is, is certainly very far up the adoption curve, I think, with strategic buyers less so. Um, I don't know if that's just our sample size of transactions that we see, but it just seems like it's a very nice fit for private equity who does not have, in many cases, doesn't have an ongoing relationship with the company. I don't know if your perspective is, is different, but that's, that's our take. I, I think that's right, and I think the other part of it is that you know, the growth of the product was driven by, by financial yeah. buyers, private equity shops, and it was because I think they really saw this, this pricing arbitrage opportunity and the strategic advantage that they were gaining, and, and they were less focused on, you know, post-closing. It really was winning the deal, getting the deal done. Um, but the interesting thing is, is how M&A, the landscape, has changed over the past few years. Instead of buyers introducing this concept, you know, sellers now really are introducing the concept early on in the sale process. So by doing that, you're forcing bidders to focus on this. And so now strategics that are participating in an auction, this was never on their radar, now they're stuck with it. And, you know, I think that some people are very reluctant to change. Uh, and strategics in particular typically know how they like to do M&A, and this isn't how they like to do it. The interesting thing, though, is, is now that they are on notice and some strategics have started using it, they're sold. You know, we, we've had some repeat buyers that were very, very reluctant initially and now come back to us every time they're doing an acquisition. We're looking to do a disposition. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the driver of this, and I think still the, the most frequent user, are the PE shops, but the, there is a very strong uptick right now in strategic buyers also incorporating it into their uh, deal. Yeah, and I, I would say there's not a sell-side assignment that we go out with a purchase agreement on where it doesn't contemplate rep and warranty insurance in a private company situation. and. There's, in some cases, we're going out with a, more of a public company type concept because of what the rep and warranty market has pushed uh, the competitive dynamic too. But we can talk about that in a little bit. You mean it's discussed in every deal before you go out, or your recent experiences? You, it's part of the auction package. It goes out. We're baking it into the agreement, yeah. or having the attorneys bake it into the agreement. Remarkable. Yeah, that is remarkable. And I think it's a function of the fact that it's very much a seller's market today, yeah, and, and they can dictate dictate the terms of their own exit. I think once the tide turns, that might not be the case, but, I, but I, I agree with Matt. I mean, we get phone calls more from sellers, you know, at the start of the de deal process than we do buyers these days. It, it is definitely a function of the M&A yeah. market, yeah. Well, great, thanks guys. Let's, let's turn now to uh, a brief discussion, just sort of on policy basics, nuts and bolts, some, some comments about pricing and retention, uh, buyer policy, seller side policy. Josh, maybe you can guide us through those? Sure. So the most common form that we see is, is a buyer side policy. And what that means is that the buyer is the insured and the beneficiary under the policy. Probably 80 to 85 percent of the deals that we actually place for that. And a buyer would be pursuing this to, you know, either supplement, enhance, or to use in lieu of an indemnity. The other side of this, though, is if, if a seller 
it has sold the company or is about to sell the company and they are beholden to a, a rather robust escrow and you know a, a rather onerous indemnity and they want some sleep at night coverage it could be somebody who's built a business over 30 years and you know they really want to make sure that their heirs have access to this money and while they know that that business is very clean you know they want a little bit more certainty and comfort that that money really will be there. And so the purpose of that sell side policy would be the seller would be the insured and they're really backstopping their indemnity obligations under the purchase agreement. Maybe can you give us a little like you mentioned the the breakdown between buyer side policies and the seller side policy. It seems to me that there are some real advantages to the buyer side policy um, and maybe you can just kind of take us through, you know, what those are and, and why that ends up more buyer side policies being bound than seller side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's a number of things. Uh, the first is, you know, the survival period under a buy side policy um, is going to be longer than the typical survival period that you'll have under a purchase agreement. So the general reps or the operational reps of the business are going to survive for three years under a policy, typically under a purchase agreement, you know, depending on who you're representing you would want that to be something between 12 and 24 months. And for fundamental reps and the tax reps, that's going to survive for six years under the policy. Now, you know, many people say, well, typically we have that survive in perpetuity under the purchase agreement. You know, it's a practical complication that you can't have a insurance policy survive in perpetuity. So they try to match this up with the, you know, outside date of what the applicable statute of limitations would be for those um, particular reps. What you also have through a, an insurance policy is that a buyer can buy coverage up to 100% of the purchase price. So if under the classic indemnity construct, you really were only getting coverage up to 5 or 10% of the purchase price for breaches of those general reps, now you have an opportunity to really get additional coverage for yourselves. Um, and I think in addition to that, sometimes you're able to get better coverage under the policy you know, particularly with respect to the applicability of a materiality scrape or the definition of loss that's going to be stronger for the insured under the policy than what, a, you know, a very forceful seller is going to offer up in the indemnity package itself. One, one key point on this slide that we're looking at here is the third bullet point, I think, and this may be you know, for someone that had experience taking a look at a policy, say, five years ago versus where the market is today, this, this, I think, is a change in the marketplace that, you know, I think, again, we alluded to this before that, you know, one of the previous limitations really on the product is there was so much excluded. But the policies today do, uh, whereas in the past, I think there were typically, you know, a package, uh, a subset of the reps and warranties in the purchase agreement that were excluded from coverage under the policy. And that's that's no longer the case. I mean, you're insuring over um, all the all the reps and warranties in the purchase agreement by and large, is, is correct? Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, what I understand, again, it predates when I was at Aon, but, you know, a number of years ago, carriers were marking up every individual rep and qualifying them for purposes of the policy, or they just weren't sure how they really could get comfortable diligencing, you know, particular reps. And today, Really what we say is that carriers are, are really willing to cover the full suite of reps and they're not going to be cherry picking them, provided that they're really within the bounds of reason. So, for example, you know, everybody would have in a normal purchase agreement a knowledge qualifier around threatened litigation. You know, say except as disclosed on Section 310 of the disclosure schedules, there's no pending or the knowledge of seller threatened litigation. If that knowledge qualifier wasn't in there, you know, that really would be out of whack and out of bounds. And that would be something where the carriers would raise their hand and say, come on, you know, we're fine with a strong package, but it has to be a reasonable package of reps. And they might identify that one as, as being modified. But on the whole, the goal really is to cover the full suite of reps. Great, great. I think one other thing we can focus on in terms of a buyer side versus a seller side is the opportunity. When you're, when you're buying the seller side product, the seller cannot insure against the seller's own fraud. But, so <laughs> you don't have that insurance on the seller side, whereas on the buyer side, you have that opportunity to get those that insurance for those reps and warranties. And, of course, there's a subrogation issue that comes up later if the seller has, in fact, committed fraud in the reps and warranties. That's a very good point, yeah. Let's talk a little bit uh, about how the pricing works and how retention works and, and how that matches up with your typical uh, the indemnity you know, basket and cap and the purchase agreement. Sure. So, uh, you know, what we say for normalized pricing is that the cost of the policy is going to be a function of how much coverage you're buying. 
So using very easy numbers, if you had a $100 million deal and you want a coverage of, of $10 million, premium costs typically are 3 to 4% of the limit you're buying. So 3 to 4% of that $10 million. And your all-in cost after you factor in the diligence fees and taxes and other fees is really going to be another 50 basis points. So it'll be more like 35 to 4.5% of the limit that you're buying. Now, some people will say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but what if I wanted coverage for 20% of the purchase price or 50% of the purchase price? I think the pricing would more or less hold true that it would be 35 to 4.5%, provided that you're covering the full suite of reps. Sometimes, though, you would cover, you know, all of the reps for the first 10% of purchase price, and then you wanted additional coverage just for the IP rep or just for the fundamental reps and getting that up to the full value of the purchase price. When you do that, obviously the risk profile for those selected reps is going to be different, and, and you'll, you'll obviously receive a discount uh, you know, for that additional coverage. One thing, uh, yeah, we talked about, about this a little bit uh, as we were preparing for this, and I asked you and Matt uh, this question. I found your answer is very interesting, and so I'll put it out there for the benefit of the group. Is there a, anything you see in, way, in the way of an inflection point on the premium pricing where, you know, at, at certain threshold level or below, uh, the option makes, you know, the, the insurance option makes sense uh, to, you know, a given type of buyer or seller? And if the pricing, you know, if something were to happen and premiums were to be priced, you know, above that level, the attractive, uh, attractiveness of the product would uh, be eroded in some meaningful way. And where do you see that? Yeah, I think what we've seen as the market has matured over the past couple of years that the product works best in where you have a situation where it's a deal value between $100 million and call it a billion dollars. I think before it was maybe a little bit wider, a little bit smaller deals it would work for. We're seeing that the, the economics become a little bit more challenging as a percentage of the deal to, to make it work sub $100 million. It still can work, and it obviously depends on the, the risk profile of the company and, and what somebody's perception of that risk profile is. And, and when we were talking beforehand, Josh mentioned another very practical point, which is the retention amount. It starts to get relatively large uh, because as a, as a fixed dollar amount, insurers are typically looking for, I think you said, 800000 to a million. So as a, as a percentage of the deal, that starts to look a little large if you have a $50 million deal. It may not be that different than what otherwise was an escrow. And so there's, things start to break down a little bit below that $100 million mark, but still possible. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, what I would add to that are, are a few things. The first is, you know, pricing is based really upon how big the policy is, not so much the deal. So if you had a $50 million deal, but you wanted $10 million of coverage, pricing would still normalize. What happens, you know, I think is what Matt was alluding to, is, is when you get down to the lower rungs and you're really looking for a 4 or a $5 million policy, carriers have minimum premium levels, and that's what's going to be driving the price up. So, you know, they might charge $200,000 for that $5 million policy, but they probably were charging $200,000 for an $8 million policy, too. And so it almost benefits you to get a little bit more coverage than you were looking for because it's effectively going to cost the same price. Well, and the other point I thought was very interesting is, that, you know, sort of the, the leverage point is this minimum uh, retention amount. So you see on the slide the typical retention is 1% to 2%. But as you say, if, if you know, there is a, a fixed dollar sort of minimum that the insurer, below which the insurers are no longer comfortable, I mean, if you're trying to solve for a, you know, a, a situation where you know the buyer is asking for you know a ten percent escrow and the seller is uh, only comfortable with you know a five percent escrow and it's a low you know a low dollar you know a relatively low value deal and you can't get you know just because of that minimum retention level you can't solve for that disconnect then the, you know that's then one of the real benefits of the products kind of uh, it starts away. to break down at that point yeah. in terms of yeah. Yeah, I think a, a worthy nexus to draw here is, is we're talking about pricing and, and we haven't really drilled into what the retention is and how it works. When, when we, you know, describe pricing, the all-in cost as being 35 to 4.5% of, uh, you know, the limit that you're seeking, it, it's on the assumption that you're going to drive that retention down as low as you possibly can. And think of a retention as a, just like a deductible under your other insurance policies. It's really just insurance jargon. There, you know, is a subtle distinction there. But you know, this again is predicated on the fact 
that you are driving it down as low as you can. And that would be between 1% to 2% of enterprise value. But certainly, just like you know, your auto insurance or, or any other, the higher your deductible, the lower your premiums. So there would be a discount afforded to you if you set that attachment point at 3 or 4% of enterprise value. Great. I think we've hit on several of these, but we have a, the next couple slides, Josh. I don't know if you have kind of anything we haven't hit yet that um, goes to sort of the advantages of the product over the typical construct of a seller indemnity or a, um, or a holdback. You know, one of the things I see on the, the buy side uh, set of bullets that we haven't really talked about, I have not really seen, is the ability to provide a post-closing remedy um, to a buyer where otherwise there wouldn't be any. So the, the paradigm for this would be the public company deal where typically the reps and warranties don't survive the closing and um, therefore the buyer has no recourse in the event after closing that they discover a breach. Are you seeing, I, and I have not seen the, the product used in that way to create a post-closing remedy in a public deal. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing much of that? or It's much less common where, where you really are ensuring a truly public deal, um, but it can be done. Some people speculate that that'll be the next wave. Um, you know, but there are different structures, really, that you use when, when you're doing a truly public-style deal, right? You're relying on the 33 Act and 34 Act reports that somebody is filing with the SEC, and the nature of the reps themselves is going to be a little bit different. The applicability of materiality qualifiers or an MAE qualifier is also a little bit different in a public deal versus a private deal. But we certainly have and, and continue to do some public deals. Um, you know, I think a few other bullets that we have on there that, that are also worthy of mention is Sometimes you have the context of, of there being a, a meaningful management rollover. And you don't want to be faced with the dilemma where you're having these guys stay on and run this business for you, but it turns out that there is a breach, and now you're sitting on this loss, and what do you do? Do you go after these same guys that you're entrusting to run the company and ruin that relationship and, and potentially lose all that intellectual capital that you were you know, valuing within the company? Um, or do you have to eat the loss yourself? And so by transferring that risk to a third party, you're really solving for that issue because you could still be made whole while preserving the relationships that you're, you're counting on with those prior owners or those prior managers of the company. Um, and then similarly, you know, you might have a very diffuse shareholder base or, or there might be some risk of creditworthiness with respect to the seller. So it's all well and good that you have this very robust indemnity under the purchase agreement, but if you could never actually collect from them, what good was that for you? And so sometimes when you have that concern there too, you know, it makes sense for you to be pursuing an insurer you know, that you know is well-funded rather than this, this speculative person. Great. You know, one of the things I found interesting as I got to know the product a little bit better was understanding that the market uh, for various terms in the in you know the standard rep and warranty insurance policy uh, is disconnected in some ways for the market for those same terms in the context of negotiating um, a seller indemnity or a seller holdback and there's some examples of it here on the slide in particular survival periods and the limits um, and a couple you know maybe a couple points that only a deal lawyer could love um, the ability to negotiate around the materiality scrape in a policy and how losses are, are defined. And just to take that last point for just a second, I mean, the, in, in negotiating with a seller, the definition of loss, and in particular, whether or not the buyer can get recovery for its consequential damages for the breach of a representation or a warranty can be a very uh, hotly negotiated deal point um, that, that matters to the buyer, but often, you know, it breaks, if you look at the deal studies, it breaks about half and half, so which suggests that buyers only get that about half the time. But when you look at a, you know, you look at a representation like the financial statement, you know, the, the representation that the financial statements are accurate, that's really how the buyer is pricing the deal. And if that representation turns out to have been breached in a way that, um, you know, would reduce the EBITDA uh, on which the, you know, the multiple was based, um, you know, not being able to recover for some multiple of earnings theory on the buy side is a real limitation of the indemnity. And Josh, I mean, it sounds like 
the carriers at this point have gotten to the point where you know that point and in, in, in I should say you know in the typical negotiation with the seller around an indemnity it kind of just becomes a you know a bit of a stalemate uh, whereas the insurers I mean I think they're at a point now where they can kind of monetize this right you want you want consequentials included here's your premium no consequentials here's your premium in a way that you can't really it, it creates a dynamic that you don't have when you're negotiating across from the seller yeah I think that's right and and this is I think one of the key things that really changed over the past few years because the the traditional form that an insurer was using and quite frankly the base form that they still use today has an outright exclusion for consequential and multiplied damages irrespective of what your definition of loss in the purchase agreement is going to be and it was you know the notion of, of them getting comfortable with the fact that they can go silent just like purchase agreements go silent with respect to these damages that I really think changed you know utilization of the product and so I think John you're exactly right they, they have monetized it and <laughs> quite frankly I think everybody is holding their breath to see if they monetized it correctly um, <laughs> because this really has happened over the past year or year and a half and so you're, you're really waiting to see how this lag period plays out to see if they priced it correctly. Um, and I actually think that, quite frankly, I know you weren't asking this, but I, uh, I'm very free with my opinions. Um, this, this really is going to be very interesting with respect to the future of the product, because I don't think the product will go away, but I think that there is the potential for pricing to change if suddenly the carrier's loss ratios are dramatically increasing, because they're invulnerable to multiply damages when they never were before. Um, and it's a blessing and a curse. You know, our business um, doubled twice over the last two 18-month periods, you know, because this product is just exploding. And it's exploding because the coverage is getting better. But, you know, ultimately it will be a question of, of is it too good? Um, but how it really works, you know, it, most of the claims that we're seeing today whether it's applicable or not, every claim that comes in, they're saying, you know, our, law, our direct loss was a million dollars, but it, it affected earnings. Um, and, you know, we, we valued this company based on an EBITDA multiple of 10, so our loss really is $10 million. You know, please send the check to, to me, you know. Um, and, and, you know, of course, just like if it were, you know, something that were negotiated in the purchase agreement itself between buyer and seller, I mean, that will be subject to negotiation um, and, and discovery as to whether or not that, that multiplied damages loss really is applicable. Well, Josh, let me set up um, my next question with a little tribute to David Letterman on the eve of his retirement from late night television. He, for years, he introduced his viewer mail segment by saying these are actual letters from actual viewers I have an actual email from an actual client, so I'm, I'm interested in your reaction. It says, the insurance, talking about rep and warranty insurance, the insurance will ask for another round of due diligence. They will eliminate all more or less the topics from the coverage and will slow down the process significantly. What say you? <laughs> what, what say me is, look at my gray hair. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm a former M&A, a prior, former practicing M&A attorney, um, and most of the sophisticated brokers out there, you know, are, are similarly situated to me. Certainly within my team, we all are. Um, and the carriers have now staffed themselves with former M&A attorneys too. Uh, and, and that really, there's a lot of value to be ascribed to that for a number of reasons. One of which is, you know, we were abused so terribly as M&A attorneys that we just expect that we're gonna have to work nights and weekends. <laughs> And we do. Um, I have a newborn at home, so I was working and binding a policy, I kid you not, at, at 2 o'clock Saturday night. Um, I thought you were going to say in the delivery room. That would have been very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me why. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I think a function of that, though, is really we have figured out a way to streamline the underwriting process and also to make sure that we're operating within, you know, the deal timeline. And I think that would be consistent with, you know, your experience yeah. too on, on deals we've done together and apart. Um, but the principal thing is, is that when this product was in its infancy, there really was a second round of diligence. And, and I think people realized, A, that was, you know, there, it was causing the, the M&A process to be disjointed and, and there was risk there, execution risk. And B, it was just inefficient. And so today, the way the underwriting process works is the insurers really are leveraging off of the diligence that the buyer has already done 
assuming that it's a buy side policy. Um, and so it allows them really to underwrite the transaction within, you know, call it five to ten calendar days. Um, and so, you know, it's not disruptive to the process. Typically, the carrier is going to be engaged a week or two prior to the signing of the purchase agreement. And so the goal is that the policy will be fully baked by the time you actually sign. And so if there's a gap between signing and closing, coverage could actually begin at signing. And coverage will cover you for any breaches of the signing reps that are discovered after signing, as well as breaches of the closing reps that are discovered after closing. Uh, what I'm not saying, but I am going to say, is what it's not going to cover you for, though, is an emergent breach. So if there is an interim breach that happens between signing and closing, and it prevents the company or the seller from bringing down that rep at closing, they can no longer restate it. And you have knowledge of that. Because you have knowledge when that rep is actually made, that would be excluded from coverage. If, however, that interim breach occurred, but you did not gain knowledge of it until after closing, since you didn't have knowledge of it, it would be a legitimate claim under the policy. Thanks, Josh. So another, another area clients are interested to hear about, if, particularly if they're new to the product, they, they want to know some more about how bringing a claim would work, and in particular if they've ha become accustomed to a certain you know, kind of uh, dance with the sell, if you're on the buy side, you know, with the seller. They, 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 have, you know, they have some experience with bringing these claims against either an escrow or a holdback, and they know how that dance works, but they want to know – you know, how will it be different if I'm bringing this claim against a third party that wasn't involved in the deal? And, you know, will it be harder for me to make a claim, less hard? What's, what's going to change? So I, I think the answer really is that it, it's a similar dance, but perhaps a more sophisticated dance. Um, you know, just like if you were going directly after the seller, the seller is going to want to have information about the breach and there's going to be a bit of a back and forth, you know, as to how you quantify what that loss actually was. And so here, you know, just like if you were to submit a, an indemnity claim under the purchase agreement, you would be submitting a claim notice to the insurer, you know, and the insurer will respond promptly requesting additional information. Anecdotally, what most people say is that, it, you know, it's similar to or more favorable, the claims process under the insurance policy relative to if they were going after a seller. You know, and some people argue, well, I have a bird in the hand with my escrow. Why would I bother going through this arduous process with insurers? And I think that's a half-truth because it's not as though an escrow account is a cookie jar that you could just reach into and pull something out of. You know, just like the policy where you would need sign-off from the person who's paying you, you know, funds aren't released from an escrow unless there is a joint instruction from the buyer and the seller where it's finally adjudicated by a court, you know, dictating that it's a legitimate loss that could be drawn on. Right. Um, and Dan, um, you've been uncharacteristically quiet over there. From a <laughs> litigator's perspective, I mean, what, what would you think? How do you anticipate you know bringing a claim against an insurer is going to differ from bringing uh, against an escrow or a holdback? Right. So a couple of things. First of all, I actually I agree with Josh that for the most part, if we've done our job right, depending on what the goals were in getting the insurance in the first place you're hoping that there are not actually a lot of differences. You are really marrying up the policy with the indemnity provisions and escrow provisions so that it really is about the same argument one way or the other. The policy is pointing right to those provisions, and you'd hope that that would actually be the case. Um, there are going to be some differences, however, and so just to highlight a few of them, the most obvious one is now you're dealing with the policy first. And as with most insurance, uh, at least in my experience, um, you know, the underwriter knew what the goals were when the underwriter was involved in the first place. The claims adjuster who now may be handling the issues uh, doesn't necessarily know the goals that were being tried to accomplish by placing this insurance in, in the first place. And so what winds up happening is the claims adjuster goes and looks at that policy and reads it from a new light that says, what are those exact words and what are maybe the gotchas in that policy? And let me just give you an example of something that we've been talking about a little bit here. So we have this product that might well be able to cover consequential damages in some instances, depending on what loss is. And if you haven't been very careful about how that policy works from top to bottom, what might happen is you wind up with either a definition of loss or a definition of breach in the policy 
that turns back toward those indemnity provisions and says it will pay for a breach of an indemnity provision, where the indemnity provision then actually only specifies that it's not paying for consequential damages. Now, when the underwriter said we're paying for consequential damages, everyone knew what the goal was that was being accomplished. When the claims adjuster looked at that, he says, well, you know what, I've got a bit of a disconnect here, and I'm not so sure that we were aiming at that risk in this position. So you're going to have a little bit more work to do with that insurance company, maybe on some of those, on some of those issues. Timing, um, you know, realize there's another set of folks thinking about this and working on this now, and you're going to be getting the insurance company involved and you're going to be getting those folks, you know, asking their own set of questions, trying to determine those facts for themselves. And that may be true, by the way, the way these policies work, even when there isn't necessarily coverage being sought specifically for the indemnity that you're working on right now. So what might happen, for instance, is you wind up in a situation where you're still within your escrow, you're still within your retention, but you have obligations under the policy to make sure that you are providing notice to the insurance company, and the insurance company is going to be deciding things for itself. Now, we're not going to talk about it because I don't think we'll have time to do it, but there are going to be times when the features of the policies will permit you to erode your retention with uncovered losses and times when you can only erode your retention with covered losses. And what that might mean for you, actually, is that you might go to the seller and get resolution of a lot of indemnities and feel like you've gotten all of your retention eroded by the payment of those indemnities over time. And then if those same issues needed to be covered losses in order to be counted toward the erosion of the retention, you might even years later be in a position where you're trying to convince the insurance company, well, no, no, those were actually covered losses, and you wind up almost sort of relitigating after the fact whether or not, in fact, those were or were not indemnities to be paid or whether they were covered losses under the policy. So you're going to have more work to do from, from that perspective. I'm not suggesting that it's any different than the type of work you would typically have with insurance companies, uh, and some insurance companies are better at paying that than others, uh, but you will have those extra steps. And then the one last thing I wanted to mention just a little bit, and it's sort of that naughty S word of insurance, which is subrogation, uh, which everyone always asks, is, wait, wait, what is that? Um, so one issue that does come up then, of course, is Let's just take the example of, uh, that was used earlier, uh, where you had uh, your key personnel being retained and the insurance is there in part to specifically make sure you don't have to make that terrible choice of whether you're going after those key personnel. Well, do realize that if the insurance policy has subrogation language in it, you might lose some control over what actually eventually happens in that process because subrogation rules may kick in and, and have the insurance company saying, look, you are required not to waive any claims you may have against folks that we could go after for those losses if we pay them. So it, you want to make sure up front what those rules of the road are going to be on things like subrogation. You're going to have those additional folks involved in that process. Uh, but overall, obviously, uh, there's a lot of advantages as well. Good. Uh, thanks, Dan. And I'm looking forward to informing my seven-year-old that the dirty S word is not, in fact, the word he <laughs> thinks it is, but subrogation, <laughs> which I'm okay hearing around the house from time to time. <laughs> Let me take a quick time out here. I'll give you that secret code uh, for the New Yorkers. The code today for CLE purposes is U as in uniform, J as in Juliet, K as in uh, Q as in Quebec, 881. That's UJQ881. So let's quickly go through the timeline. Uh, Josh, you, you alluded to this uh, and the ability of the insurers to new, move fast and that they're staffed with people that work on deal time, and that's consistent with my experience as well. But maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the timeline and then how those of us that, that manage M&A deals sort of as project managers you know, what, what are the key deadlines we need to be aware of so that we can work these work streams into the broader work streams for the deal? It's a good question. So it depends a little bit on, on who really is interested. If it's a seller and they're really trying to control their own exit, uh, we typically would get a phone call you know, early on in the sale process when the, buy, the banker has just finished drafting their SIM and you're, you're talking to your attorneys about what that auction draft of the purchase agreement is going to look like. Um, at that juncture, you really would want a gut check about the insurability of the product 
and you would want to figure out how to most effectively communicate uh, that information to bidders so that you're managing expectations and putting them on notice that you, you know, you're assuming that reps and warranties insurance will be incorporated into the bid. So when you do that, again, it would be early on, and it would take us about four business days to, to turn around a quote. If you're a bidder, usually what happens is you've already received access to the data room and you've received you know, some management materials and you're, you know, you're really starting to talk about the, the asset and a bid is due in two weeks. You would want to factor into your bid what you expect the coverage is going to look like and how much it would cost. So there too, you know, with about a week lead time, you would approach us and ask us to obtain quotes on your behalf. That's phase one, really, of, of obtaining coverage. And what documents, Josh, is the carrier going to need in order to produce the quotes? Good question. So we need background information on the target so that both we and the carriers can get an understanding of what's actually being sold. So ideally, it's going to be some kind of a SIM, um, but you know, sometimes if it's not an auction or it's a less formal auction, you might not be hiring a banker, um, and there would just be you know, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that management puts together to, to show potential bidders. So we would excuse me, use that together with the uh, most recent uh, copies of, of the financials of the target. Uh, you know, worthy of mention here that, that audited financials are, are not quite necessary, but pretty much necessary. Some carriers uh, will settle for reviewed financials if they're supported by a quality of earnings report. Um, but on the whole, it's really fi audited financials that would be required. So you would take that SAM or management presentation, you would take the audited financials, and then we would take a draft of the purchase agreement. Ideally, if it's a buyer's side policy, it would be buyer's initial markup of that purchase agreement because that's really showing the carriers what's the worst case scenario. It's going to be the most onerous package of reps that that document will ever see, right? Um, but realistically, most people are working on that, that markup until, you know, an hour after your bid is due. Um, and so carriers will settle for that auction draft of the purchase agreement or seller's initial draft um, and they'll understand and they'll be hedging. You know, either you know, way you're using opposite ends of the goalposts, the quote will say, we're assuming that at the end of the day, you're going to have something that's a little bit more in the middle. Um, so that would be those three principal documents and then just an understanding of what kind of coverage you want. You know, are you looking for a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce when it, it comes to coverage? Are you looking for coverage of up to 10% of the purchase price or do you want to see 5, 10, and 20? Are you contemplating that there would be a limited seller indemnity to help you satisfy the deductible under the policy or are you envisioning a public style exit? So, you know, talking with your broker, hopefully a sophisticated one that would know to ask these questions, you would formulate all of that, which would then be submitted to the carriers, and they would then turn around those, what we call non-binding indications, or the quotes that you would use when, when uh, you know, submitting your bid. Then we move on to phase two of the underwriting process. So this is after you've received your quotes and you're going to pick a horse. You, you know, you'll call back your broker and say, hey, great news, we won the deal, we have exclusivity for four weeks or 48 hours, whatever it is, um, and we want to move forward obtaining reps and warranties insurance, what do you need from us? And so it's at that juncture that we would actively be engaging an insurance company. And at that moment, there would be a, an underwriting fee that would be due. That would be the first dollars that you would have to pay. And it's usually between twenty dollars to $45,000, depending on the carrier and the complexity of the deal. And then the formal underwriting process begins. And so from there, the carriers are going to obtain access to the data room. They're going to sign uh, non-reliance letters so that they could obtain uh, the diligence reports prepared on behalf of the buyer. And then they'll have an underwriting call a few days after they've had an opportunity to digest those reports where they'll be asking buyer and buyer's advisors. Seller and seller's advisors will not be involved in the underwriting process. They'll ask buyer and buyer's advisors, you know, specific questions about the company, why you're pursuing the transaction, you know, why this was on the disclosure schedules or, or something peculiar that they noticed in the SIM, or they really want to drill into something, you know, uh, the benefits plans or the IP of the company. And so you'll have your specialists on the line to help address those questions. Coming out of that call, typically there will be follow-up calls that we'll need to run to ground over the next 24 to 48 hours, and we'll concurrently be negotiating the form of the policy. And that's when you'll really be relying on counsel, as well as the principals at the buyer. And then, you know, assuming that you have a sophisticated broker, that that broker, too, really will be rolling up their sleeves and digging in on the policy. 
Well, that's one thing I wanted to comment, uh, wanted to ask you to comment on briefly, Josh, because this was something that was not well understood by me the first time I went through this, is the role of the broker in all this versus the carrier. That's a, the new party to the deal table. So maybe just in you know 30 seconds, just tell us a little bit about what the broker does here. Sure. Um, so one of my colleagues says, just because your plumber knows root canal exists doesn't mean you want him to do it on you. Um, and his point is, you know, everybody knows an insurance broker, but it doesn't mean that that broker specializes in this particular product. And this is a very, very nuanced product, and it's very bespoke. And so, you know, it's important that when you're looking for a broker, they really have a lot of knowledge and expertise about the product. What value are we adding here? Part of it is, is helping you structure your solution. And so when sellers come to us, it's let's talk about strategically what is the best thing that you can do to get yourself the cleanest exit. From a buyer's standpoint, it's what can you do to win this deal but make sure that you're getting the best coverage that you possibly can. And that's at the very start of it. But then through the underwriting process, you want to make sure that you have somebody that's available that, that has enough knowledge and expertise about the policy that they're not just a paper pusher. You know, we pride ourselves today on, and not that this is supposed to be a sales pitch, but there is not a policy that we place that we are not ourselves marking it up. And usually the principal draftsman, quite frankly, you know, we'll be working in tandem with counsel, but that's what we do. And that's where we're adding a ton of value because, you know, this is, this is my day job. I do, you know, 90% of what I do for a living is working exclusively on reps and warranties insurance policies. So we know what the state of the market is. And so it's really helping facilitate and smooth that underwriting process, guaranteeing that you get the best coverage available. And then what most people never think about is, and what if there's a claim? And so you want to make sure that you have a sophisticated broker that can leverage the relationship and understands the claims process to make sure that you're getting paid out to the extent that you should. So it's kind of like the same reasons you might want experienced M&A deal counsel on exactly. a file. Well, and, I, and I was just going to add to that, actually, just to emphasize here, because this is not a form policy, there is opportunity. We've had great success, actually, taking these and working with folks like Josh and the underwriters to make sure that you really do mark up that policy. Folks are really, everyone sort of intuitively understands the, I'll ask the insurance company and they'll either say no, or they'll say, here's the form endorsement that I have that sort of kind of does what it is you're after here. So this is really an opportunity to all roll up your sleeves together. And we've had a lot of good response from insurance companies on that. So we, we have a package of slides and also some of the appendices hit on this as well. And I'm afraid we're not really going to have time to go through them. And, but I think, Matt, both you and Josh have alluded to this earlier in the program. There really is an opportunity uh, with this product to think about how it can be deployed strategically, either as a buyer or a seller, to make you know, a bid more attractive if you're a bidder in an auction situation or a seller uh, coming out in an auction to, to package the asset in the most attractive way possible. And some of those slides get it um, examples, uh, case studies and other examples where the, um, where the product's been used in that kind of strategic manner. And I'd encourage you to take a look at those as well as a very detailed kind of financial model at the back about some of the, you know, the co you know, co costing this out versus an escrow. Um, with the time we have left, I would like to call your attention to, we, we focus very much on insurance policies that cover representations and warranties, but there is, there is a package of insurance package that, that can cover other common uh, transactional liabilities like environmental and tax, um, some things about contingent liabilities, fraudulent transfer as well, and, um, you know, Josh has a lot of experience with those as well. I encourage you to talk to him afterwards if you have questions about those products. But with the time we have left, I really would like to open it up for you know, a couple questions. We have about five minutes. If, if anyone has a question, and uh, we'd be happy to hear it. Yes. Yeah, the question for the folks on the web is uh, how often are they being used in cross-border transactions? Good question. Thanks. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, putting aside cross-border for a second, you know, the penetration rate in, in the U.S. is something like less than 10% of, of eligible private deals. Um, in Australia, it's north of 70%. Uh, so it, it's really very interesting. Europe uses it more commonly as well. Um, 
what we've started to see over the last couple of years, though, is, is what's the interplay with cross-border deals. Um, and it does become very challenging. Um, we, we certainly do them, and we do them quite frequently. The, the million-dollar questions are going to be, well, how is your purchase agreement structured? Is it a U.S.-style purchase agreement? Is it governed by U.S. law? You know, where are the assets and where is the buyer? And all of these can be solved for. I mean, I'm doing a deal right now where it's a European asset, um, and it's a different, you know, jurisdiction, a European buyer, but it's a U.S. private equity fund that was selling the asset, and the purchase agreement is structured such that it's governed by U.S. law. So, you know, we kind of had the worst of every scenario, but we still get it done. And, you know, from a, a insurance standpoint, the ideal, I like to think, is that you're going to get what we call U.S.-style coverage. It's really going to look much more closely like what a U.S.-style indemnity is going to look like. You know, usually if you have a European-style purchase agreement and, you know, there's that deemed this disclosure concept, right, anything that's in the vendor due diligence report or anything that's in the data room, you're purported to have knowledge of, and so you wouldn't be able to make a claim under. So the coverage is going to match that construct in Europe, and it's going to be a little bit more limited. Very, very rare and very, very hard to do. Sometimes you could even get, though, U.S.-style coverage for a European-style deal. Anybody else? Good question. question is, uh, what, what is the minimum premium in the market? So it's going to vary from carrier to carrier. Um, I'd say on the whole, the minimum all-in cost you're going to spend is $200,000. That having been said, uh, and that really would correlate with like called a, a $5 million policy. Um, that having been said, some of the carriers have realized there's a very underserved portion of the market here, and that's the lower middle market. And they, they've just recently or, or are about to launch um, really a, a smaller product solution or smaller deal solution. Um, and so theoretically, you should be able to get now coverage for a 3 or 4 or $5 million policy, and it's going to cost you less than the $200,000. But normalized, you know, for the bigger deals, that's probably going to be your minimum spent. Great. Well, with that, I really want to thank Josh and Matt. This has been just terrific. Thanks for your time. This has been very educational. We appreciate your participation, and thanks uh, to all of you for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That was terrific.